Remember Real Conferences and Tulaski as name tag sponsors? Now Tulaski is a division of professional audio designs. They join Acoustic Systems as platinum sponsors for the league. This triad has served orchestras through lush acoustic environments, excellent audio, and acoustic enhancement technology. Please attend our webinar and visit our virtual booth to learn how this team represents sound thinking. It's great to see Henry Fogel on screen just now. And uh, I want to thank Professional Audio Designs, Acoustic Systems, and Talaski, whom you saw in that opening video, for their sponsorship of our opening session. In fact, before I do anything, I want to thank all our sponsors and business partners for their incredibly generous support. Our platinum, platinum sponsors, Bennett Direct, Acoustic Systems, Professional Audio Designs, and Talaski Sound Thinking. Our gold sponsors, Arts Consulting Group, Aspen Leadership Group, Healthy Minds Innovations, Nave Strategies, and Threshold Acoustics. Our silver sponsors, Acoustics LLC and TRG Arts. Our bronze sponsors, Boomerang Carnets, Fisher Dax Associates, Instant Encore, Onstage Publications, Opus 3 Artists, Robert Swaney Consulting, Samets Blackstone Associates, and Kierkegaard and our supporting sponsors, BMI and Giuliano Kornsberg. Please pay all our business partners a visit in the virtual exhibit hall throughout the conference. We really couldn't do this without them. Um, and if you, you can find them by pressing the exhibitors button in the left-hand navigation. And I want to say a big thank you to every single one of our sponsors for sticking with us in this, our second year of online conferencing. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us online over the next 10 days. We don't underestimate the many demands on your time, especially right now at such a pivotal moment. And we hope you'll be richly rewarded by the stimulating series of keynotes and discussions we have lined up. More of that in a minute. So there's no question that we stand on the cusp of a huge, huge burst of energy in our field as orchestras explode back into life again after a year and a half of the most appalling challenges. Of course, in a few parts of the country, concerts with audiences have continued this past month, and we're so impressed with what's happened in Dallas, in Houston, in Jacksonville, Omaha, and a number of other places. But for most of us, music has been in our computer screens, a kind of technological marvel that has been sometimes frustrating, but often surprisingly moving. And the emotion is perhaps all the more acute because of the tremendous personal hardship that so many have experienced this year. And because it definitely wasn't a given that every orchestra would make the journey. But most have, and in fact, I think all, all have. And this is an incredible affirmation of the resilience of this field. And when you think about it, where does that resilience come from? It comes from our people. People who through everything they knew in the last year at keeping the music going and staying in touch with audiences. I'm thinking about the musicians playing in impossible conditions, distant from each other, separated by plexiglass, struggling with masks, but still making great music. I'm thinking about the operations team, working teams, working with scientists and hospitals and public health agencies to create safe conditions for everybody. The digital technology experts who produce new platforms almost overnight the managers and administrators redoing their plans every month, every week, sometimes every day, again and again and again as the situation evolved. The audiences and donors and foundations throw, showing unprecedented generosity in order to keep orchestras alive and support the musicians and staff they cared so much about. The orchestra committees, who worked with common cause together with boards and management to find ways to keep the music playing. And this last one I will say is personal to me, the executive directors and CEOs facing a daily range of impossible decisions, often somewhere on a scale from bad to worse. And, and many, many, many others, of course. And it's literally impossible to find words strong enough to reflect our admiration and gratitude for what you've all done. And when the dust settles and we look back on this period, I think we'll see it as a time, yes, of suffering and hardship and loss, and there's been plenty of that. But I think we'll also see it as the moment when our field achieved the impossible through the power of creativity, teamwork, 
and sheer persistence. So thank you to everyone who played even the smallest role in this collective achievement. And although the challenges are still not fully behind us, I really do think now we have an opportunity to turn to the future. And the future is what this conference is all about. Let me just say something about this. First of all, we have constituency meetings. Over the past year and a bit, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've hosted around 200 constituency meetings in more of them. And, 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 there's, since the, and there's, been a, there's been a trend towards those meetings becoming more and more curated with special speakers and facilitated. And I think that's a trend you're gonna see through this conference. And I really welcome this because I think this is where some of the most meaningful discussion happens as well as, of course, the amazing network of support from colleagues who you can call on to go through the same as you. So the constituency meetings, in a way, are at the core of any conference that we do. But for the main plenary sessions, we've made a conscious decision to stay out of the weeds, as it were, and instead to try to tackle the really big questions, the things that concern everyone as we come back to a world that's very different from the one we left 16 months ago. Each day of the conference has a different theme with a combination of keynotes, panel discussions and interactive sessions. And each day is emceed by a leader from our field who's also played a lead role in the curation of that day's content. It's a new, new structure and I'm excited to see how it works out. And I'm really pleased to see the voices of our field you know, centering the discussions on each day's. And I strongly urge you to take part as an active participant. Many voices are what make a conference rich and dynamic. And of course, the racial reckoning of the last year has been a time of intense change in our field. It has correctly been a time of questioning, self-criticism, learning, and new commitment to action. And although it's early days, I'm genuinely excited about the steps forward orchestras have made after far too many years of far too little change. And by the way, I include myself in that calculus in my years running orchestras. So this is long overdue. And at the League, other than our baseline commitment to supporting orchestras in their missions, nothing matters more to us than our work advancing racial equity and building a more inclusive and fairer orchestra world. So you'll see that like a persistent and insistent thread running right through conference. So welcome. We're gathering remotely, but we come together with tremendous solidarity and purpose. And uh, as I've been having conversations with managers around the country in these past months, I really feel the winds of change in the air. It's an exciting time, and we're really glad you're here with us. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the league's board chair, Doug Hageman. As every exec executive director knows, having a great board chair is absolutely critical for success. And at the League, we're so fortunate to have Doug, not only with his long experience in business and as former chair of the Milwaukee Symphony, but also he's someone who has a great love of music and a great love of our field. And uh, it shows in his leadership of the League. So, Doug, over to you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I want to share my admiration about the incredible work orchestras did this past year and are doing and the amazing resilience of our field. Uh, before we even get started, I do want to thank our, all of our league staff and all of our speakers and presenters for the hours of preparation that make these two weeks possible. And I want to welcome all of you conference delegates from all corners of the country, even from Hawaii, where it's only 930 in the morning. We've, we have nearly 1,300 people representing 340 orchestras in this conference, and we will together embrace the change world through many timely conversations over the next two weeks. Now I'd like to thank the Ford Motor Company Fund for their continued support of the Ford Musician Awards for Excellence in Community Service, and also for making possible the Ford Musician Impact Fund administered by the League this past fall, which, which assisted 165 orchestra musicians from 92 orchestras in making their digital presence stronger during the pandemic. Musicians are, of course, at the center of our orchestral world, and we celebrate today five award winners and honor their extraordinary contributions to their communities. So let me introduce and welcome Giselle Cabrera, Government and Community Relations Manager at Ford, to present this year's Ford Awards for Excellence in Community Service. Ms. Cabrera, over to you. Thank you, Doug. Pleasure to be here today. You know, supporting arts and culture where we live and work has always been important to Ford Motor Company and the 
and family. And we believe that arts have the ability to transform, educate, and inspire. That's why we're committed to supporting organizations that incorporate arts and learning, inspire creativity, and build multicultural understanding of the communities where we live and work. The Ford Musician Awards for Excellence in Community Service recognizes orchestra musicians who have made an outstanding contribution to their community through music. This year's award recipients used music as a therapeutic tool for adults with severe and persistent mental health challenges, provided pop-up concerts during food bank distributions, brought orchestra musicians to a regional hospital, organized front porch private violin lessons and schoolyard group classes during the pandemic to reach the digital divide, and brought the joy of music to toddlers and their families. Please join me in congratulating the recipients of the 2021 Ford Musician Awards. Jeremy Krosmer of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, John Terman of the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, <laughs> Miho Hashizume of the Cleveland Orchestra, Lorraine Hart of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, and Sean Clare of the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra. These five musicians have truly gone above and beyond for their communities over the past year, creating lasting positive impacts during such an uncertain time. Thank you for bringing the joy of music to so many. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Simon Woods. Thank you, Giselle, and thank you to the Ford Motor Company for your long-standing for support and for helping us celebrate these amazing musicians across our field. At the League, you know, we do believe that everything comes back to artistry and community, and so this is a this is a wonderful moment to be able to celebrate these in, celebrate these in, incredible musicians. So thank you so much. Um, it's now a, my great pleasure to introduce you to an old friend of mine and also a long-standing friend of the league, Maria Len Bernard, president and CEO of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. And uh, Maria Len has a few words for us about league giving days. Welcome, Maria Len. Thank you, Simon. I'm delighted to be here and to see so many registered for this year's conference. This has been an extraordinary year for all of us, one during which every orchestra in the country has benefited from the League's work, from regular constituency meetings to webinars, and of course the critical work of the advocacy that has been supported by the phenomenal Heather Noonan. So this summer marks for me 25 years since I entered the wonderful world of orchestra management through the League's Orchestra Management Fellowship Program. And at every step of my career since 1996, while working with small and large orchestras in Philadelphia, Cleveland, Canton, Boston, and now St. Louis, the League has been a resource to me. So I give to the League as an individual because I'm grateful for the professional development opportunities it gave me, and also because I am committed as an orchestra leader to sustaining the League's programs and research we all benefit from. And um, philanthropy being key to the League as 70% of its income comes from donation, I'm inviting you, whether you're here as a board member, a musician, a member of management, an educator, a business partner, or a volunteer, please join me in supporting the League by making a League Giving Days gift. Remember that any gift counts, and what is meaningful to you is meaningful to the League. You can make your gift today by clicking the Support the League button on the conference website or by visiting AmericanOrchestras.org backslash Stronger Together. So again, thank you for supporting the League and enjoy the conference. Thank you, uh, thanks, Maria Len. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. It's so great to know your your long-standing history, uh, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that pitch. Um, and uh, 
you know, I want to say in advance, thank you to everyone who chooses to participate in League Giving Days. Uh, as Marie Ellen said, it, it is absolutely a critical time for us. Um, it's our turn where we have to, to raise money to support our, our operations and to support our ability to support orchestras. So we are grateful in advance to everybody who makes a commitment at whatever level to League Giving Days. Every single one of you will be deeply appreciated. So now, it's time for our special guest. Wynton Marsalis is one of the treasures of American music. Thanks for joining us. I'm so happy that you joined us. I was really worried we were going to lose you. Fantastic to have you with us, Wynton. Um, yeah, it's really my pleasure. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. You are such an icon in the music world, and it's just a pleasure to have you as part of our conference. So here's where I want to start. In the conversation you and I had to, to prepare for this discussion, I was struck by the way that so many of your ideas about culture and society are, are relevant to orchestras as we emerge from the pandemic and, and, and look at our double down on our missions. But before we get into that, I want to start off with asking you a bit about a context, about your, your role at Jazz at Lincoln Center. And I think this is important for everybody to understand because I, I personally hadn't understood it. So your, your title is managing an artistic director. And, and in that role, you oversee not only the entire artistic program, but also a full management team. And this is a little bit different from the orchestra world where we generally separate artistic and executive leadership. So can you tell us a little bit about that and, and tell us why you think it matters so much to have um, both of those functions reporting to you, so within your jurisdiction? Well, for me at Jazz at Lincoln Center, I worked for years under that model with the executive uh, director and artistic director being separated. But it was very difficult because the uh, the control of the organization through the budget, whenever you want to do something, there's no money for it. And not having the business sense and the financial sense to know what to risk on and what not to risk on. When you don't know what an art form is and you, do, you don't know really what you're selling, you may have wonderful business sense but you're gonna have a hard time with a business that requires a lot of nuanced understanding and a lot of uphill selling. So after 23 or 24 years working in that model and a lot of different problems, I became the managing and the artistic director. And for me, it's a little different just because uh, because of, we're very basic, like all the arts organizations, our finance is very, very basic unless you're stealing. So it only becomes complicated when you're trying to do something that you're not supposed to be doing. Our business model is, is very straightforward and simple. And for me in the role I have had now for 10 years, I've had a great executive director and a great CFO, and we have a great team. So it's easy for us to work together uh, on the business issues surrounding our organization and also the balance between the power of the artistic vision and the practical nature of it, and also how we conduct and execute our business and what our business objectives are. Of course, I grew up without money, so I'm not somebody giving to just spending piles of money just for fun. So revenue is very serious to me and the expenditure of it. And do, do you ever find yourself um, like pulled in two different directions of feeling like you want to make one decision artistically, but the business, the moment for the business uh, asks you to make a different decision? I can only imagine that there must have been a lot of tension between that, particularly during the pandemic. This year, I decided that we would we would stay on and keep almost all of our staff. We went from $24 million in revenue to two, and we knew it would be uphill. We knew everybody was kind of closing. We furloughed some some staff, and we, we did what we had to do. We went from like 120 to, to 80. The building was was not uh, working to its capacity, so I mean, to, at all. So it was a struggle. We all had to work very, very hard and find revenue in many places call we were on the phones a lot we did a lot of good community work and we're we're two weeks from from the end of the year we still our budget we have a we're still hustling but yeah we're within a million or so of it i mean we see it whereas when in in uh in september in, in june in la our, our fiscal year ends in, in, in the end of june we didn't see it especially because we had survived march through through June and we're able also to pay our staff their entire salary and keep everybody in their health plan and everything. Uh, at that time, I was telling our staff, we always say stuff like we're family and all of that. Let's see if we are that. 
And have you seen the same thing that we've seen in orchestras, which is the a lot of your donors and supporters really stepping up to support the organization? Unbelievably. Yeah. I called and talked to a lot of people. Uh, unbelievable foundations and what people did to look out for us has been uh, just like in New Orleans after Katrina. What the, what the nation did for our city was unbelievable. So can you talk to me? I want to go a little bit deeper on this this business art thing because I just think it's really fascinating. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, this document you have, which is called The Jazz Way of Doing Business and how you use your art form um, to actually inform your management and leadership values and processes? Well, when I, when I came in to be the managing director, we had had a crisis because with jazz, the business side of that is always trying to undermine the art. It's not the same in classical music because many administrators in classical music are also classical musicians and they love the art form a certain way. They've gone to camps, studied, they love the literature. Our field is not the same. Jazz is just basically a field which is, it's a struggle. When you get arts administrators many times, it's, it's like a lot of educators, they may know a little something about the music, but their objectives are not aligned with the music. So the first thing I did was deal with the budget cycling, how the budget was laid out, and how things looked on the page. So I use music for everything uh, that I try to do. So if you think of when you're looking at, uh, I just think a board of directors looking at spreadsheets calibrated in millions. People who are not in the finance industry don't even know what numbers they're looking at most of the time. Make stuff easy for people to understand and come up with forms that are like a sheet of, like the front piece of a score of music. If you think of how efficient that document is, and we just think of the front page of a complicated work, you can take your pick of your favorite complicated work, and you look at that front page, all of the things you can tell, the keys of all the instruments, the tempo, when it was written, who was the composer, all the tempo markings. Things took 200 years to refine, 300 years of refinement and are trying to figure out how to make that document as elegant and efficient as possible. So my first thing was to be as efficient with our with our budget cycles, with our, with our documents, and make sure that people understand every number of everything. And I would always tell them, no conductor worth anything looks at the front page of something and so the French horns are an F, or I can't transpose it. I, don't, I wonder what the bassoon is playing there. Well, I don't know, but I'm sure it'll work out. You have to figure out what everything represents. And certainly our budgets are nowhere near as comp as complicated as any 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 even Duke Ellington Harlem score. If you have to read that, there's a lot of information in that score. I, I often um, like the um, the analogy for management of solo soloists and chorus. Um, and you know, I one of the things that's 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 interesting about great organizations is great organizations have to have a lot of people in them who can have play both roles so they can be in the chorus and they can harmonize with people and they can uh, they can work as a team but then they need to step out uh, uh, as leaders and so and i expect that you that's very much a that's very much a fe feature of jazz that seems to apply to management well i wrote this document called 12 principles of jazz business and the document actually went through in specific detail how business practices are aligned with our musical practices and one is that if you take the fundamentals of jazz, one is improvisation. So that is your leadership and your personal sense of style and things that you do where you are in control of the form, the logic, and the continuation of the piece. The second is uh, swing. And swing means you're responsible for everything. Swinging means you're in sync, you're coordinated, and you're making intelligent decisions that account for the fact that you're not alone. The swing forces opposite instruments to play together, like the bass is the softest without an amp and the lowest, and it plays in four, and the symbol of the drums is the loudest, and it plays in six. So for the duration of a song, they have to figure out how to play together. And uh, swinging means also to play in extreme coordination with the time. And then finally, so that's your sense of your, of your, uh, of, of your business, of your department, and how your department relates to the whole. One of my things with the budget is understand where you are in the overall budget template. Just like you're going to be a much greater third trumpet player, if you know the function of your part, what the first is playing, and who you, if you have a doubling, if oboes are playing, the more you know about a piece of music, the better you are. Right. I often will give my staff the example of I played basketball in high school, and I was point guard, and one day in the, in the practice, the coach blew the whistle and said, Marcellus, 
how many points does Moya make? So he started to call different players on the team. And, you know, I was, I would guess the points. I was kind of close, but not really. Assist, how many rebounds this one? So I didn't really know. Then after he got to the fourth player, he asked me, well, what do you do? Oh, 11 points. You know, I knew all of my stats. And when I finished giving my stat, he said, that's why you'll never be a good point guard. And then he blew the whistle and we started pre- rehearsing. So I always laugh at it because it was a way of him teaching me, you need to know what everyone is doing if you're going to distribute the basketball. Now, of course, the game has evolved since that time. If you want to be, you look at these teams they play, the greater teams are more intelligent, the positions are at every player, and the more they understand the function of their decisions on the overall goals and objectives of the team. We strive for that. And finally, with the jazz analogy, blues is a fundamental of jazz, and that's the period we're in now, which is we have an optimism that's not naive, which is why I believed we could stay together, keep our staff together, keep people on, do the things we needed to do, make sure the orchestra got paid, deal with all of the different changes we have. And at the end of the day, which is at this point, the end of this particular fiscal year, even though COVID is by no means over, we will figure out how to work things out and come with come with a much stronger organization and one that's more connected. And I think that's what has happened. So you went over some fantastic words there, which I just made a mental note of. Just amazing words. An, an optimism that is not naive. And that's a, I want to just take that as and and go to the next uh, go to the next topic here, which is I, w- I want to talk a little bit about what does come next. Uh, I think we have good good reason to be optimistic about the arts um, and about their role in society. But you know, as vaccinations liberate us from the constraints we've been in in the last year, we also know that many of the social barriers and in, inequities in so- in society are not only not solved, but they've gotten worse. Right. So so how how can we like optimistically look forward as organizations, but also think about what our role is to, to help society to be, be better? And I know that's something that you care deeply about. In your music. Well, the first thing is you have to want to do it. Think if you wrote a story of what you did, but you actually wanted it to be true. And then you had to do what it took to make it true. Man, it's a long distance from you being in your backyard saying, I'm going to be a quarterback in the Super Bowl and you being Tom Brady. (laughs) But as organizations, we have to determine, do we want to do that or do we just want to talk about it? And if we want to talk about it, that's fun, too. You know, I mean, our our, since the civil rights movement, our culture has gone, the direction has gone all over the country. The desire was to move away from civil rights. And we've done that very successfully. Education is separated. It's it's a racial, not only racial, but it's also class. Um, It's more difficult to get to gender separation because even though the genders are different, you know, we're going to propagate our species. So those are separate issues. We have a tendency to conflate all issues. Everything is, is one thing. And we have to look at the things, the decisions that we've made, and we have to figure out now the arts have to be a voice of super wisdom. And we have to be now conservators of the mythology of the country and make the adjustments to the mythology to make it congruent with the, the highest aspirations of the culture. People have come. They've left us with music and art and plays and all of these things. If we choose to mine through what has been created to give us a good baseline, to educate our educate our uh, our constituencies. However, we can always very cynically pick the unqualified, dumb down our things, and have these dreaded black weeks and all other stuff that we do that's so patronizing and it make you give you a stomach ache. And we'll end up with orchestras playing video game themes for their concert series. So okay, so I hear you saying it has to be authentic and it has to be meaningful but it also has to protect the values of the art form that that that, that we have been blessed to have an art form which is has has right. extraordinary richness to it so when you look at the classical music world um and you know one of as, as obviously we're in a moment in the classical music world where we're the, the whole racial aspect of the classical music world is under intense scrutiny as it should be um what you know, it's classical music world's a little different to jazz. Where, where, where should we go? What are your hopes for the classical music world as we as we come out of the pandemic with a different opportunity, perhaps than we've ever had before? Well, I would like to see black for black people an embrace of the classical, and I would like to see the classical 
the programmers who have been taking people of a concept of whiteness, which is something that's, that has nothing to do with the greatest composers. I mean, Shostakovich, he wasn't thinking I'm white. He trying to figure out how to deal with it. And uh, I think that the groups, the arts, we have to, we have to say to ourselves, do we want people in our community? And uh, we take a system that is segregated by class as, as well, but race is, of course, in America much more uh, much more explosive as a part of our identity as just who we are, basically. We make so many decisions that are that, are that way. But I'm less in the school of, uh, of, of the victimized and, and, and to just look at me. And, and I, don't, I don't think that's productive. I feel like what's productive is to get the greatest achievement of Afro-Americans and other composers, women composers, whoever, whoever it is that we deem as an other. They have been great people of every race, ethnicity, gender, find them like you do anything. And put, however, the achievements of Bach, Beethoven, Bach, uh, Brown, Krauss, Bach, this goes on and on and on, is the, one of the great libraries of the world, including literature. There's no way in the world you should ever undermine those great masters. And if anything, our communities need to know white and black. I've taught in schools around America. <laughs> white people don't know about the music either. And we have a challenge to teach them who these great masters are. And they can't be seen through the prism of race only as much as they're not treated as if they're seen through the prism of race. I don't see them through that prism. However, I, I do work in a, in a field that sees them that way. And we need to correct those things and make people understand how rare a master is. Then they, people won't throw their names around with that level of disrespect that I hear out here for any cause, not just racial. So. So, well, I think it's so interesting you talk about that. I mean, this is definitely a subject that I think our field is is uh, really right in the middle of right now. I mean, this is a this discussion is is alive and well in our in our world here, which is to what extent have we have we supported over many many decades um, and probably centuries a, a vision of the field which is which is one entirely one dimensional about basically about white the tradition of white European music, but. I struggle with it. And I mean, you know, I think many of us struggle with the fact that we love a lot of the repertoire that you've talked about. And we also don't want to see that talk down. We want that to be part of our future. And so, um, you know, because it has enriched so many people's lives and it continues to enrich so many people's lives, it's just not the full story. So it seems to me that getting getting the, the balance right um, is maybe the thing that is lies in front of us. Perhaps you know, just 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 being able to recognize that it's a yes and answer, not a not an either or answer. Well, I think maybe, but it's it's important to understand that there's a big difference between Europe and America. I mean, European music is from Europe. I mean, I'm going to require French, not be French. That's a that's a request. America, however, we're a different place. We have a lot of music that's not just your people. If we chose to read, we have composers who've written American music, white and black composers. We did. Someone like Leonard Bernstein wrote a senior paper at, at Harvard. Was His thesis was on racial influences in our music, and it's been an ongoing discussion uh, going back to the 1800s. We ran Dvorak out of America because he said black, black America's music is the foundation of a lot of American music, and, uh, and and we played up to him saying also Native American because with the Afro-American, it's always you want to figure out something to kind of water it down and put something in there to make it seem like it's not what it is. And he was he actually had to leave this country and go back home. And he, no way in the world he wanted to do that. And, and my good friend Mark O'Connor, we've talked about that for years. So we've done many things. However, in the class that Dvorak taught in, uh, in, in, in New York, in, in, his first class included Reuben Goldmark, who ended up running Juilliard and was, was a, an influence on Gershwin, and Will Marion Cook, who was an influence on Duke Ellington. So those two people, Gershwin and Ellington, that's a whole swath of American music. And all of the great uh, composers we've produced since that time, none, it's, it's very few have, have said we're against this music. But I think our systems in our country is a certain way. And you can take it any, any way you want from the urban renewal that ran highways through black folks' communities to the travesty of the prison plantation system that exists now. Classical music cannot solve all those things. What we have to do is be in our communities, try to be more expansive in our communities, be very hands-on and grassroots-oriented for whites and blacks. Because believe me, I've gone to schools 
I don't just go. I have not all the 40 years I've been out there. It's been just I'm going to teach black kids. I've taught more white kids than black kids. And they're not aware of these traditions either. And we need to try to use our music as a way to heal and bring people together because that's what the greatest musicians wanted to do. What is Beethoven saying in the Ninth Symphony? We can go down and down the list of people that was there. Their message, let's live to that message, but we have to do it at home. Now, a group of people who are all the same discussing how they need to do better. I laugh at my own organization, which our staff is largely white, too. We're going to have another training about how to deal with black people who are not here. OK, <laughs> let me sit through another five trainings. That kind of stuff is 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 it checks a box. To me, it's corny. It's something people want to do. Great. But more important is that we have something productive we are doing in our communities that will make a difference for families. Not You're not going to do it with kids. Now, I've been teaching kids since 1980. And I'm telling you, when I see parents and kids, the first thing I'm looking at is those parents that are up at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night with their kids. And I'm saying, is this your mama? Is this your daddy? That's white or black kids. Remember your mama was here at 11 o'clock. Remember your father. You're not going to come up with some way to avoid an adult to get to some kids. We need to have a holistic community approach that deals with parents and kids who are not exposed to our music. And we need to kill And by our, I mean classical music. Beethoven's music is my music. We need to figure out what we can do to expose them to the powerful and best of this music, all the things that are designed for kids, invite them into this music. And we need to be very aggressive in the community. Most of our time in the arts is spent trying to fight the management and the staff. If we knew how stupid that was, it's like you're spending all your time fighting inside of a system that your larger culture doesn't even care about. So I go back to what you said at the beginning, which was we've got to decide if we want to do this work and if, yeah. we're, going to, if, we, if we want to show up for it. And um, I, I, you know, when I look at orchestras, many orchestras across the country have you know, pretty interesting community programs and, and pretty interesting and pretty successful education programs. But what I'm hearing you saying is that actually this needs to be a much more important part of our work and it needs to be at the center of our work, not just something off to the side. And that it really needs to be a, like a vibrant focal point of our missions. Right. And I don't, I don't know what they're doing, but I would submit to you all that's not interesting or successful. Or audiences would look different. And that's a right. all of us. I'm not speaking outside of our field. Like I'm speaking down to you. Some kind of fake black is paid to tell you something that's not going to work. Like what happened in the 1970s. <laughs> I'm a part of this system, too. And the failures in my institution are my failures. And we have had many failures on this on this end, not just racial. So I understand the dynamics and the difficulties of it. And I understand also with democracy, it's a battle we have to fight every day. It's like a battle you have with your weight. It's just much easier to go ahead and eat a pie and say, I'm going to do better tomorrow. So, so jazz, we, we tend to, in the classical world, we tend to think of jazz, I think, as a, as a, you know, as a kind of a popular art form, which automatically speaks across boundaries. And I remember when we were talking before, you said you, 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 have, a, you have huge struggles with trying to diversify your audience. Can you talk a little bit about, and I'm really interested in what you said about, you know, you, you've had your failures as well. I, I think we'd love to hear, like, what has worked and what hasn't worked for you in, as, you've, as you've been trying to broaden the appeal of jazz? Well, the only thing that's worked is sustained development with, the, with groups of people over time. Like we send a group into a, uh, high schools three times a year so they get a relationship with that group and then we attach it to something in the curriculum. Uh, uh, community concerts that you can get subsidized where there's still a ticket price, but people can bring their kids. But those concerts were successful, but they're still segregated concerts. Um, we need to do more than what we've done. Jazz is a challenge. And you have to realize that in America, the pastime for black people has always been the menstrual show. And if something is menstrual, use the N-word, call people negative names, celebrates pimps, the entire nation gets behind it. There's plenty of resources for it. If something places a black person in a truly heroic role, intellectually or philosophically, deals with the country, those people are almost always American. American, uh, like a person like Martin Luther King was not a racialist. But when he's presented, it's a black leader. He wasn't a black leader. He's an American leader. He led a coalition of people. So when you have figures in our music like that, the one that always comes to mind, of course, first is Duke Ellington because he's the greatest. There's a, 
he's not suitable for the national mythology. So they're going to go to the minstrel show. So it's going to be somebody who, you know, I don't even have to say so many of them out here now. And uh, the arts in general are under siege. And when a group of people are taught that it is acceptable and rewarded for making a fool of themselves, it's hard for them to like things that are not foolish. That applies to blacks, but it applies to whites as well. Because a lot of what you see in the larger white population, that population that's exploited, that's undereducated, that does not know what happened to the America of their dreams, is the stuff that they're interfacing with, much of it is foolish, and their sole vision that is foolish. So they gravitate toward foolish things. And, and if we want a, a, a richer democracy, those who have education, insight, and by no means does it mean, I don't mean a college education, I just mean who understand a little more of what's going on. Instead of exploiting, we have to determine, hey, we're going to use our budget, we're going to use our resources, our staff, and all these things to further this particular vision of America, and this is what it's going to cost, and this is what we're going to get our donors behind, and this is what we have to do. It still remains to be seen if we want to do it. I still have to see if my institution wants to do it. Of course, we're always pushing in that direction, but we have a long way to go. Do you come up against um, resistance ever because the work that you see as fundamentally humanitarian and around civil rights and civil, civil, li civil liberties is perceived by others to be political work and a boundary and a boundary that you shouldn't cross? Have you encountered that? No, I, I don't encounter that. I, I encountered a benign resistance that's very definitive. It's like what I said. I, I encounter people who don't want to do it. I mean, I had a younger white staff telling me what Black Lives Matters meant. You know, I'm living in the real world, <laughs> the lab sometimes. And I would say, okay, give your job up for the people who matter. Like there's a lot of a lot of tribal sloganeering and uh, stuff if you're my age. I lived through the 60s and 70s, so I understand about it. And uh, I see the type of easy, res the resistance that's pervasive because it's easy. People don't want to sit out and argue with you about politics. It's a certain person has a certain level of power to tell you you're politically motivated. I'm not motivated by politics. I would like to see America be a more informed country, more enlightened, more artistically enlightened. And I also don't disrespect great European composers, dead white men and all of that. I'm not a part of all of that. It's, it's imbecilic to me. Uh, so I don't, and, and I'm, I'm, I've also been against prevalent art forms that use the N-word that everybody in our nation embraces. I've never embraced it. I'm against it. And I stand against it, and I don't care who's mad about it. But And, and that's why when we talk in this conversation, I'm too old now to be patronizing and playing around. I have too much skin in the game and stake, and been, been out here too long, too many students and parents and kids. It's too serious a thing to play around with. We all need to, it, this is going to, we have to pay dues to this. It's a flaw that has always been in our nation. And if we want to lead the way in the world for how groups of people can get along and not be tribal, we're doing a terrible job right now. And um, it's, it's, it, it breaks down on a community level. And we have to, uh, just yesterday, I'll give you a prime example. We played in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We played with the Tulsa Symphony. Fantastic uh, experience. We had playing a piece I wrote called All Rise. The concert mistress's husband is a jazz trumpet player. We're the same age. So we played the whole concert. And, you know, the city is divided. They're talking about 1921, the massacre. After the show, I'm, I'm talking, I'm signing people's autographs. So a, a friend of mine from, from high school, we was high school, was a, was a white guy who I, who I always loved. He was always just dipped in gold. I stood out by his car. We talked for a long time, laughing his kids and some of their friends were in the back seat. And when I, when, I, when I went away from talking to him, one of the guards says, how you know that white fella? I said, I went to high school with him. He said, yeah, y'all look real familiar. I said, yeah, we're, we're familiar. He said, too bad the country can't be like that. And it's, we say that to each other now that we're a certain age. Me and my friend Steve, we always say, man, did you think we would be like this when, when we're 60? Because we were just, we were 14, 15. And we talked about those issues then. It wasn't like we were 14, 15-year-old kids in New Orleans not understanding all the racism that was going on. And that he didn't understand it because we, we, we would talk about these things all the time. And, uh, you know, we just have to be for real about what we're going to do, because it's not going to be a kumbaya. You saw with Obama, everybody thought they could, we're going to kumbaya our way into just where well, everything is good, because we're a guy from Hawaii comes in, and now everything is okay. No. And the arts are the centerpiece of that. Educate people. Bring them the masters and the greatness of classical music to people, and teach people to see things in a non-tribal way. And it doesn't matter if somebody's a woman, if they're white or they're black, what are they saying? My father always said, don't tell me who don't tell me what somebody is, son. Tell me who they are. And we need to double down on that. 
So as you think about that and what comes next for you, what are, you, what are your ambitions? What is your uncompleted work in terms of musically and making a statement about these, some of these humanistic issues you've been talking about? Man, I'm out here, man. I'm always saying the same thing. I'm saying what I'm saying right now. I'm for real about it. My daddy was for real about it. And a lot of people are about it. I've seen so many people, parents, kids, musicians, artistic administrators, so many people are for real. We're going to stay for real. So uh, bringing our nation closer, living up to our highest aspirations and ideals, knowing something about who we are, opening the best pictures in our in our album book, and, and programming great musicians. I told them, now I'm going to program all the white jazz musicians. Not everybody's more tribal. I'm going to go in, in another direction because the tribalism is the thing that you're trying to get away from because it's been great people of all kinds. And then so far as the orchestra programming and all of that, yeah, you could put some black people in these spots that you put the contemporary piece you don't like or something, the 15 minutes, because I'm always called upon to write a piece like that. Can you write eight minutes or something we can program second that's not innocuous, just in a spot that we can say somebody black wrote something and it's not so long that our audience is going to be mad if you write something sad? You could put any, You could put any type of people in these spots. Put more people in spots and let people see. But at the end of the day, putting them in the spots is not going to cure the racism. The racism is going to be cured by letting people know who Beethoven was and what he was saying, what Shostakovich dealt with. That's going to help you cure this racism. Who was Bach? Let people know the strength of classical music and the beauty and depth of it and get more people in in these halls. That's going to help us cure it. Right now, we've come to the end of this session. And we will uh, look forward to seeing you later. We have the National Symphony Orchestra concert at 7 p.m. Um, with a pre-concert talk and a short introduction from National Symphony Executive Director Gary Gensling and me. Uh, and then the concert should be really wonderful. And then tomorrow for our f- uh, full afternoon of activities around digital media and its importance and uh, the trade-offs between digital and um and in-person live performance, uh, which we will explore tomorrow in depth. So please join us there. Thank you so much for, for, for joining today on this first session. Sorry we had a few technical glitches this afternoon, um, but uh, hopefully you found something interesting and important in it anyway. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being here, and we will see you later in the conference. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much.